verse 52. So we'll read 51 and 52 together. And then we'll go back and read the purport in 51. All the mental speculators and learned scholars were defeated by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And when the people began to laugh, the Buddhist philosophers felt both shame and fear. The Buddhists could understand that Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a Vaishnava, and they returned home very unhappy. Later, however, they began to plot against the Lord. Report. These philosophers were all atheists, for they did not believe in the existence of God. Atheists may be very expert in mental <coughs> speculation and may be so-called great philosophers, but they cannot, but they can be defeated can be defeated by a firm Vaishnav situated in connect conviction and God consciousness. Following in the footsteps of Sri Jaitanya Mahaprabhu, all the preachers engaged in the service of ISKCON should be very expert in putting forward strong arguments and defeating all kinds of atheists. Om Agyan Timidandasya Kinantina Salakaya Chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri guru vena maha shri chaitanya mano bisnam stapitam yena bhutale svayam rupa kadamai yam tadanti svapadantikam jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nitananda sri advaita dadhar sivasi gor bhakta vrinda hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare hare so there may be various types of spiritual movements and spiritual philosophies. But unless there is a conception or an understanding and a worship of a person, God, then we might say that that teaching, philosophy, is either incomplete or incorrect, either one, or both. In the sense that religion really means to understand one's relationship with the Supreme Absolute Personality of God. The Lord is a person, sometimes even religious, who are very much fixed in the worship of God have a hard time understanding the conception of person. They think person, and then they think in terms of us, or our individual characters, personalities, and natures. And it becomes inconceivable or impossible for them to connect the idea of personality with the Supreme. They say God is everywhere. So if he's everywhere, how can he be a person or have a form? That means he's limited or he's in one place. But so many other, when we say, arguments based on what is called speculation. When we say impersonal, not impersonal, but imperfect observation. And the conclusion is, no one can understand the, the nature of the Supreme Personality of God unless they engage in devotional service. Only by then Krishna reveals, Krishna said to that Arjuna, only by the undivided, he said, undivided devotional service can I be known as I am standing before you and thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you under, enter into the mysteries of my existence, my understanding. Devotional service is the only way to re reveal the concept of personality of Godhead. There are many people who worship deities, many religions who worship deities, and also chant the holy names of the Lord. But they have an impersonal conception of the Absolute. They think beyond the form is the formless. Beyond the name, there is no name. Because if you put a form, or you put a name, when you put anything on God, you create a type of limitation. Therefore, that limitation is not right because it limits something that's unlimited, which is God. But 
Krishna is so inconceivable that he can be a person at the same time be unlimited. He can have a form and be located in one place and be everywhere at the same time. He walks, but he doesn't walk. He talks, but he doesn't talk. He's near, but he's very far. These are the statements of Sri Vishupanishads about the nature of the Absolute. So, when we hear, hear the, the Buddhists, <clears throat> their understanding of the Absolute Truth is that everything becomes nothing. The conclusion is nothingness. So what does that mean? That this material world is simply an illusion. And when you get beyond the illusion, there is simply nothing. And then you merge into the nothing, and you become nothing, and then you become happy by being nothing. <laughs> Sounds pretty good, right? If you're miserable, which most people are in the material world, then becoming nothing is not a bad idea. Because it's one way of getting rid of your misery. Suffering is not desirable by anyone. Therefore, the concept of, of this philosophy here is being previously explained in some of the, the previous purports here, is that you try to get out of everything material by stopping all material activities, and then you merge into the unmanifested, unlimited existence. And then, then you become happy. Buddhism, or this philosophy, is correct up to a certain point, is that this material world is a place of suffering. Bukhalyam Asasvatam, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. And he also says, Anitya Masubam. He doesn't say it once, he says it at least twice or three times in the Gita, that this place is a place for misery and suffering. It's a prison house, there's bars, chains, guards, dogs, and penalties, <laughs> and so many other restrictions. No one's free here, and freedom is uh, simply a word people use, but no one has actually understood what freedom is. So, with that concept in mind, Buddhism is a very attractive philosophical principle, because it attracts people to get out of the suffering. And so, through various types of meditation, prayers, and austerities, and seeing oneself different from everything, and one can somehow or other disconnect oneself from everything material. But you find that the nature of existence is activities. No one cannot do anything. So, Vaishnava philosophy is that you take the principle stopping material activities and you perform spiritual activities. And the goal of spiritual activities is to continue with spiritual activities, not to stop all activities. Whereas the other philosophies, you take up spiritual activities and they cease all to, altogether because all activities are maya or illusion. And they use the word nirguna. Near means without. And Runa means, refers to the material energy. So, or near mama. Near in the sense of no material, but absolute spiritual. Therefore, real activity is devotional service. That's the only activity. Sabaipum samparo dharmo yato bhakti hoksuje hoituki priyate iyatma supati siddhati. In other verses, it is explained that all material activities are meant to bring one to spiritual activities. And then material activities also become spiritual activities when they are connected with the absolute principle of devotional service to the personality of Godhead. For Kumaras, they were Brahmavadis. They had an understanding of the absolute truth as being impersonal. And they were meditating on the impersonal. But because they were not attached to their concept or trying to understand higher principles, when they came in contact with the lotus feet of the Lord, immediately they reached Bhagavan realization. 
they were not envious or freed from any conception of that was the highest. Whereas many of these other groups here have concepts that, that this is the absolute principle. Buddha came to stop people from killing animals. It's amazing. When you actually think about the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who's God, who is the Supreme Lord of all, comes to save the animals. And when you tell that to materialists, it's pretty hard for them to conceive, because animals don't seem to be very important in people's lives unless they can be used for someone's sense gratification. Otherwise, they're just, you know, they don't perform anything beneficial. So, but Buddha, who is Krishna himself, one of the incarnations, he's the 25th incarnation, I believe, 25th or 26th incarnation of, of Krishna, Vishnu, he came simply to show compassion to people who were killing animals based on <coughs> Vedic teachings. And he said, forget about your Vedas, they're simply bringing you more and more suffering and you're causing suffering to others. And suffering is the, is, the, is the principle of material existence. So he threw it out. And people followed Buddha. Meditation followed the Eightfold Way of doing good to others, humility. Buddhism teaches all good qualities. People who are Buddhists, they all have very good qualities. Material, I mean, spirit, I mean, qualities in the mode of goodness, very good qualities, but no conception of the absolute principle of personality. Sankaracharya came. He kicked Buddhism out of India and said that God is actually one, and therefore we should worship the impersonal aspect of the Lord. And his teachings spread fast, and gradually many, all of India, practically, at least in southern India, became followers of Sankaracharya. Ramanuji came. He started teaching that God is actually a personality. So gradually he started to ex uh, teach the God that is the living entity and the Supreme Lord or two. But Vircharya took it higher and Lord Chaitanya took it to the complete principle that the absolute truth is one and different simultaneously. So the history of spirituality is the history of bringing people ultimately to the highest principle, but teach preaching according to time, place, and circumstance. Buddhism preach, Buddhist, Buddha preached according to time, place, and circumstance. Sankaracharya, who was he? He's Lord Shiva. He's a Vaishnava. Vaishnavanam yata sambhu. He's preaching something against Krishna. And he also talks about that in a regrettable way, that he has to do this service. And then, of course, then the Vaishnava philosophers came. So the Lord was gradually bringing people to the, the understanding here. So Prabhupada makes one very interesting, a couple of interesting points, he said. That we should not tolerate wrong philosophical teachings. Those who knew Srila Prabhupada, or had association with Prabhupada, and those who, who listened to his teachings and words, know that he was very intolerable when it came to deviant philosophies. Very strong. Why? Because that's the nature of the material world. Everyone has some, as Prabhupada said, some idea of what God is or what spirituality is. And there's so many gods and so many spiritual ideas, one after another. So in Kali Yuga, it's becoming more and more like that. So Prabhupada was strong in very much pushing out any misconceptions of what is the, what is, what we say, different from the actual true teachings of Bhagavad Gita and true teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam. Shri Radha Lundari Shwaraki Jai. Shri Sri Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Maharani Kini Jai. Gornitai Ki Jai. Kiri Gopadana Kini Jai. 
So, and Prabhupada is just, he's rallying his devotees here. He says, the preachers engaged in service of this kind should be very expert in putting forth arguments, strong arguments, in defeating all types of atheists. Not only did he want the devotees to defeat the atheists, but he wanted us to challenge them also, and then defeat them. To go to them and challenge their ideas, their way of life. I guess we're a little shy in that department. That was Prabhupada's idea. Uh, he was like a lion when it came to teaching or keeping things in line with true or religious principles. Otherwise, a little deviation or a little misconception that comes in is simply an opportunity for something to go completely off. You know, this is like a little spark of fire. If you don't attend to it, it could turn into a great fire. A little bit of a, a cold can get turned into pneumonia if you don't take care of your cold. So a little bit of something negative also grows. And so the Prabhupada's divine grace was very, what do we say, clear that this is one of our main principles, is to make sure we keep sound Vaishnava teachings. If we're orientas paras param katiantas param nityam tushyanti cha ramanti cha, Krishna says in Gita, that Vaishnavas should every day regularly chant and hear the glories of the Lord and discuss this philosophy, as Prabhupada said, threadbare. Threadbare means getting it down to the essence. He says each verse, you can speak about it from different angles of vision and get clearer and more deeper meanings of each and every verse. Because all these verses, are given either by the Lord himself or by the Lord's pure representatives. So they're unlimited in their knowledge and in their meaning and in even, in, in some cases, in their applications also. So Prabhupada wanted us to study these books and to uh, not only distribute books but to study books. He chastised the devotees in 1976 in Mayapur for distributing but not reading. <coughs> Very strong chastisement. He said, you're out distributing my books, but if someone asks you what is in it, you say, well, my, our, our teacher, he writes and we, get, we sell, that's all. That's the best words he words. He wanted us to, he wanted us to take time to read, study, and know the books to know the books also. And there's one statement in the Chaitanya um, Charita Mita, in Matthew Vita, chapter 25, verse number 278, in which Prabhupada says, food grains, or the, the verses, food grains makes one strong and healthy, and one who eats that regularly will remain, keep good health. But simply by eating food grains, one will not be able to become Krishna conscious. So one has to read all my books. <laughs> and if one does not read all my books that we have printed for the Ziskan Society, one will again return to eating and sleeping and miss the opportunity for transcendental life. <laughs> so he wanted us to study his books and to preach the books and to also distribute the books and also at the same time be able to understand all philosophical teachings and be able to present arguments in opposition of anything that was different than the conclusions of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. So it's a great it's a great instruction. Sometimes we say, well I follow the instructions of Prabhupada. What about this one? This is a tough one. To be able to challenge people who are in positions of leadership, such as scientists and philosophers and other, what we say, spokesmen for, what we say, the common people, and say, you're wrong. 
Of course, in this age, how to preach is according to time, place, and circumstances. But for those who are putting forth deviant philosophies in the name of religion or in the name of progress, they're actually causing great destruction to the lives of people under them. Great destruction. Because <coughs> if you don't know where you're going, or if you don't care where you're going, any road will take you there. I say that. And most people, all they're going on one road. It's a really wide road. It has like eight lanes. And it's going one way. It's not like it's two, going one two way. It's called the road of unlimited sense gratification. And there's no slow lanes. It's all fast lanes. Everyone's trying to pass everyone else. And there's no hitchhikers. So that's the way of the world. And therefore, people are becoming more and more fortunate and more and more illusioned. So, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he defeated the Mayavadis, he defeated the Buddhists, <coughs> who else? You know, there's other groups. He also defeated the Takpavadis. <coughs> who are followers of Madhvacharya, who had some principles that were a little bit off. So though he was, you know, a very humble Vaishnava, chanting and dancing, he was also very strong in preaching philosophical teachings. Very strong. Not to tolerate any deviations. And those who know scripture, but are, have the mentality of using scripture for their own, what we say, personal interests or selfish ideas, can take scripture and twist it really nicely and so it sounds really, really, what we say, authentic or genuine. So devotees have to be able to see that and cut through that and be able to present the ultimate conclusion and what is the conclusion? Is that all living beings are parts and parcels of Krishna eternally. And Krishna is the absolute personality of Godhead. And the only region, way to reach him is through the process of bhakti or devotional service. All other spiritual processes can elevate one a little bit away from the material energy, but not to the ultimate goal. All other spiritual processes are beneficial in that they get one a little bit out of material life to some degree. But no one, no, nothing but what is it, Sudabhakta, or pure devotional service, can actually bring one to the understanding of one's ultimate best interest. And what is that? <coughs> to render unalloyed, unmotivated, service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Prabhupada said one time to his devotees, he said, do you believe Krishna is God? He challenged us. He said, do you believe Krishna is, a God, is God? And then he said, how do you know Krishna is God? And someone said, because you said so, Prabhupada. And this Prabhupada said, no. <laughs> That's not a good answer. I say a lot of things. <laughs> uh, what else? He said. Uh, and then he said, somebody said, because it says so in the Bhagavad Gita. Papa said, no. <laughs> he said, you can only understand Krishna by devotional service. He didn't really give an answer. He just told, he just wanted to test us to see if we actually knew or believe that Krishna was a supreme personality. And another occasion he asked that same question again, and when someone said, Krishna, it's in the Bhagavad Gita, he said, yes, that's the answer. <laughs> but he was testing us just to see and test our faith. Do we, we believe it because we hear it, or do we believe it because we actually accept it deep within our hearts and minds? Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. 
and devotional service is the absolute way to reach it, the only way. So, like that. So, Prabhupada is very strong in his purport. He says uh, many times he's very strong, but at the same time, very compassionate. Just like if you go to a doctor and you have some disease, he says, it's not so bad. He doesn't want to make you feel bad. Even though you're going to die next tomorrow. He makes him, if he tells you that, you might be from, could become unhappy. And you become, you know, you get angry at the doctor. So he just says, you know, something other than what is the truth, or takes the truth, it's called what's called sophistry. You mix the truth in with some, something half-truth. There's some truth in it. What's a half-truth? The old lady is very beautiful. Old people are, it's, it's not a half truth, it's not so What would be a half truth? Any examples? Yes. Half truth, what's a half truth? Someone. Pigs are smiling. How about that one? Pigs are smiling. Because when they eat stool, they smile. It looks like it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, pigs are smiling. Like that. But they're not really smiling, are they? It just looks like it. So, half truth, sophistry. And sophistry means you focus on what you want, either the truth or the negative. But there's always something else mixed in. So when a circumstance changes, it's, half truth is, is always wrong because the negative always cancels out the positive. It's like in the ashram. If you don't bring everyone to pure devotional service, things go down. If there's someone in the ashram who's not following strictly and deviating from the principles, that will affect the whole ashram. Just one person. That'll affect everyone's consciousness unless that person is raised up. So everything goes down in the material world unless you keep it up. <laughs> if you're not always trying to keep it up, you can expect it will go down. It's just like what happens if you don't clean a room for a while. If you clean it really nice, and then you leave it alone for a while, even if nobody goes in the room, it gets dirty, simply because that's the nature of the material world. Dust and dirt will come automatically. So in spiritual life, if we're not always moving up, we have to be really moving down. So everything moves down in this world. It always goes down, down, down. So there's an effort always to keep it up. Right? It's Krishna consciousness. Okay, so there is some other activities today. So we have to end a little early. Any questions? Comments? Yes, for me. Thank you, Maharaj, for the next class. You spoke about this um, spark of deviation that can turn into fire. Oh. And I'm just wondering, today there was a big emphasis of, on interfaith dialogue. Interfaith dialogue. Yeah, and say, I do have this curiosity what Quran and the Bible is about. So is it potentially something where it can deviate or it can be used to dovetail in preaching. Interfaith. Yes. I've done interfaith in Chicago. The World Parliament of Religions is situated in Chicago, which is one of the biggest and most reputable interfaith organizations in the world. And they also have big, big conferences in the world some places. Every five years they have one week conferences in some places. So yeah, but your faith is valuable if you use it simply as a forum for making your philosophy known. And also, that's one thing. The, other, the, the main thing for interfaith is to set some kind of coalition with other spiritual leaders. 
to bind with other spiritual leaders to see that we all have the same, what we say, goal in one sense, is to teach people what is spirituality and to maybe protect each other against attacks like that. So there's so many benefits from, from interfaith. But the idea is that you, unless you really fixed in your own philosophy, you can become what we say affected in the wrong way and accept something less as what we say the absolute. You have to be able to relate to something in relationship to what is the absolute. Nothing is wrong. Everything is relative. <coughs> wrong is something different. But relativity is what you find in interfaith and things are relative to the ultimate principle. So not everyone has the ultimate principle. It's like there's, there's, there is the Underbridge Dictionary, but then there is pocket dictionaries also. So you have to, to, be, to perform interfaith, you have to be fixed in your own faith, or you easily. And I saw that. I saw that in my own personal life. We were doing interfaith in Nuvrindavan. And many of the devotees got attracted to other traditions and actually left Krishna consciousness. Not because of the philosophy, but because of the, the rituals. They liked the rituals. You know, of other teachings. So, yeah, you have to be careful. But it has some benefit. I'm a member of the World Parliament. I don't really participate anymore as much as I did, but in the 1990s we were meeting with many of the interfaith leaders and engaging in various types of dialogues. We organized two interfaith conferences in Chicago where 38 different religious groups came and we did. But the thing that the, the ISKCON really functioned best within the interfaith thing is we cook the prasadam for everybody. <laughs> and because of that, we really became popular. <laughs> in fact, uh, in one conference, there was the dining room, and then all these little classrooms with things were going on, and the dining room was always filled. <clears throat> they said, your food is the best. So they made sure that every interfaith conference is going to have the service of providing Prashadam for everybody. <laughs> that was nice. But we also did other things too. <laughs> you were talking about that Prabhupada gave the guideline to preach against the atheists. Um, what, what I so often encounter is that people say, oh, it's fine, whatever you want to do. But they don't want. They don't like accept us or me uh, preaching. Uh, they, they think that that is actually just causing a disturbance. Why? why well, why? what causes the disturbance? Well, to for people to be to be have to think about a different way, maybe, or to uh, preaching. Be preaching it. means to say something that is correct without making people angry or making them go away. That's one aspect of preaching. Mm -hmm. How to take something less and bring it to the ultimate principle in such a way that people will be interested at least to listen. Or at least will not become what we can remember. Now, if you're in a debate, that's something else. If you're discussing philosophy. But in a one-to-one, -to, -one, to present Krishna consciousness in contrary in contrast to everything else, really, that means to somehow or other change a person's heart, and not simply to present, to defeat them all the time. Defeat, changing a person's heart, or making them favorable, is a form of defeat. <coughs> but to do it in such a way that it doesn't uh, cause people to go away. And that's the art of preaching. How to do that. Yeah. So preaching is time, place, and circumstance. So you have to learn the philosophy and also learn the technique of how to deliver the philosophy according to the situation. 
And if you can't do that, just give them a lot to push on them. That always is. Or, just like when we tell people, Chen Hari Krishna, put the faith chant any name of God, that's fine. You can chant any name of God, that's fine. And that's not contrary in any sense of the word. The idea is to glorify God. So, but in some cases when people are envious and mimical or argumentative, you can't do anything. Really. All you can do is either probably, you know, don't waste your time in that area. Yes, try to take a look. This is something that came to mind when you mentioned that the Prabhupada would often say, like, if someone said this, you know, what about this person? Prabhupada would say, what is their philosophy? Yeah. And he would address the philosophy. Not the person. Not the, not the person. Sometimes when we preach, we attack a person because they, you know, or we might try to defeat that person and not like them instead of addressing mm -hmm. aspects of the philosophy. Which Preaching really doesn't mean putting forth, <coughs> when you're discussing something with someone, if you want to really defeat them, you don't say anything about your own philosophy. You simply take their philosophy and tear it apart. <laughs> by using logic and reasoning. You ask them what their philosophy is and then you, they say something and then you show them how that's wrong. And then by enough no's, negative, they have nothing left. And then you can say something positive. That's the art of debate. But, yeah, the idea is to is to not is to disconnect the person from the philosophy. But people are very much connected, so it's hard to disconnect them because they wear their philosophy. Although they change clothes, they also change philosophies at the same time as much as they do. But still, yeah, your point is actually correct. Not to attack the person it's directly. It's But in some cases, when the persons are, are really envious or angry, then you might point something out. Like one time, one big spiritualist in India read an article that devotees got, they did something wrong in Japan. And so this spiritualist started to make that the propaganda. This is this is what ISKCON's about, and they did this in Japan. And this was all wrong. So the word got to Prabhupada. It was on a morning walk. He could hear the conversation, and Prabhupada just tearing into the guy. He's saying, he doesn't see anything else. That's all he sees is this one little article. But the fact that ISKCON is preaching, preaching so many books, made opening temples, doing so many other things, he doesn't see that. He simply sees this little speck and makes that the focus. So Prabhupada dealt with the person on that one, and not the issue. He says, this person really is simply envious. He said he's a pavana. Pavana means one who's a well-wisher. You know? That this is actually such a well-wisher that all he can see is the negative. <laughs> so. so, yeah. But two things. One, you can't imitate Prabhupada. His mood. You can, you can repeat his words, but to, to imitate his mood, maybe look a little bit arrogant, or what we say, uh, presumptuous in some way. You have to preach according to your own nature and take the philosophy and apply it that way. Some people can get happy and people like it. Some people can get heavy and just scare everybody away. So you just have to be able to see how best, and that takes practice experience. The idea is to take the philosophy apart and not so much the person. That's what Krishna, that's what Lord Chaitanya did here. Nice point. Thank you. Any other questions?
carry. So we also have to go on to book distribution and book something else, unloading books. Okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Sri Chaitanya Charitam Rita ki Om the Brain Mahanandi Hari Om. Thank you. So that's Chandra Mali Maharaj.